for anyone who was not on the stream and was not like tuned into any of the announcements I was putting on my Twitter, I actually tried to post this video four times now. And um, it was supposed to come out maybe like August 12th, August 13th, maybe. Um, so considering that it's like an entire month after, <laughs> it's safe to say that this is a little late. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's been a journey. If there is a segment that sounds odd, it's because I re-recorded over it just so it doesn't get flagged again. So yeah, welcome to the video. <laughs> There is a certain appeal to found family that has really taken the internet to storm these past few years. Maybe it's forced proximity with biological family, or being stuck in quarantine with like-minded roommates, or something else you might need to talk to your therapist about. The pandemic unlocked something in our collective consciousnesses that made found family feel like catnip. Let's take a step back then. I know we all know what found family is already, but I feel like this is a classic case of... You keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. I feel like people who love found family want to point at whatever random and somewhat functional non-romantic relationship they see and go, They're family now. And I appreciate the sentiment. I too wish to point at random relationships and go, they're family now. <laughs> I too am a man of culture, but sadly, that's not really the case when people usually throw those words around, and I feel like we need to set the record straight. For accuracy's sake, that's all. So, found family is technically an AO3 tag for its TB Tropes counterpart, family of choice. I understand adopting the AO3 tag instead because honestly, <laughs> TV tropes names for things can get a little too referential and very much American television, and I hate that with a passion that rivals 10,000 suns, but back on topic. Family of Choice is a subtrope of the True Companions. Super trope? Or just trope? I don't know. True Companions, in turn, is when a group of friends seem to have a bond as strong as your typical nuclear family. It's all purely platonic, basically the power of Nakama or whatever. You get it. A family of choice is a subtrope of that that maintains that a group of unlikely and unfortunate people, abandoned by their biological family or betrayed by them or even lost them to calamity or death depending on your media of choice, flock together and choose to become a family. It's a little rigid, but not as choosy as its counterpart subtropes. You need characters who have felt abandoned or betrayed by or are grieving the loss of their biological family, and a consenting choice to channel that into a love that their companions need, and vice versa. Think of Jinx and Silco, as well as Vi and Vander from Arcane. All four who have experienced great loss and have decided to stick together out of a need for a shoulder to lean on in their trying times. While Vander tries to mentor Vi into putting her energy into being a positive role model for Powder, Silco tries to coax Jinx into letting go of her painful past so that she can finally move on and become stronger. A more famous example of this would probably be Bruce Wayne, Alfred, and the gaggle of children in the Wayne mansion that moonlight as Batman's psychics. Alfred is definitely a big part of this, since his dynamic with Bruce is its own neat bubble of a family of choice, and the rest of the kids are just there to contrast the reality of it when Bruce himself deliberately chooses to adopt them. Barring, of course, his biological children among this lot. <laughs> a personal and grounded in realism example of this would be the houses in FX's Pose, based on real houses in areas with a prominent American ball culture. Houses in this sense are founded usually to shelter young queer people who have either run away from home or were kicked out, finding support, acceptance, love, and solidarity with each other. There is also the reluctant variant of a family of choice, due mostly to the train of thought. Well, if I don't do it, then who will? Before falling head over ass into, Oh, no, I, I can't never leave them again. There's a ton of war child content out there that is exactly like that, chief among them being both The Last of Us games, James Mangold's Logan, Navo Papuchado's Gunpowder Milkshake, and a whole bunch of others. Usually it features some lone wolf type trying their best not to care too much about their younger companion and failing miserably. 
There's been a move to deconstruct the 80s action hero that in recent years has morphed into turning them into parental figures. So that's why there's a shit ton of these examples. It's a beautiful yet clumsy attempt to redeem them and to try and match a dated toxic masculinity to the more modern idea of men facing vulnerability of any kind. Making this gender inclusive is just a matter of what traumatic thing they're willing to put a woman in the role of. Oh, that, that makes me think about how in the draft versions of the script for um, Everything Everywhere All at Once, Michelle Yeoh was not the actor that they chose for for Evelyn. Um, it was originally Jackie Chan in that role for some reason. Anyway. Now, contrary to popular belief, Shira and the Princesses of Power is not an example of a family of choice, and neither are the more common ones you might find in the wild, like the vampires and what we do in the shadows, or the immortals from Old Guard, or Mallrat from Brimstone Valley Mall, or the Kirk Blanche from Zenumbra. Those aren't families of choices, believe it or not. Sorry to say, but not all groups of close friends or reluctant teammates are found family. Should take L plus ratio. Cancel. Unsubscribe. Dislike. Negative comment. <laughs> Again, this trope is a subtrope. The one you're probably referring to is True Companions, or Band of Brothers, or Ragtag Bunch of Misfits. The AO3 tag you're looking for is not found family, but domestic. Or, you know, friendship. So, to bring it back, to be in this trope, you need a group of characters who have lost their biological family. This loss then turns into a feeling of wanting to have an outlet for the feelings they had for their lost family, which then is given to their new companions, and a choice to stick to each other, usually because of said feelings. Now, the reason I brought this all up, without using examples from Disney movies, is not just because I want to have my moment on the soapbox, I say as I step back down from it. No, it's because I very recently started writing something for recent anime spy family. Written and illustrated by Endo Tatsuya, released March 2019, animated and produced by Wit Studio and Cloverworks, and released on air on April 2022, Spy Family is an action slice of life comedy about three people. Agent Twilight, who is tasked to take up a fake family to make contact with a target. Your Briar, an assassin daylighting as a civil servant who needs to be a convincing civilian. And Anya, a telekinetic who just wants some excitement and a family to keep her out of foster care. As the story progresses, you will realize that there are three external plots winding its way around the internal conflicts. There is the main one in the form of Agent Twilight and the Westalian Intelligence. Most of the external plot will deal heavily with their goals, maintaining peace between Ostania and Westalis. This gets lost in a lot of the story, mostly deliberately because this is, in fact, a comedy. But the driving force behind all of Twilight's missions is to make sure that war never breaks loose. Operation Strix, the goal to make contact with Donovan Desmond, the whole shebang. There's a large chance that if any of it fails, war breaks loose between these countries and it's game over. The next external plot is maintaining the validity of the Forger family. This one is a two-way plot, by the way. The Forgers have to keep their fakeness a secret from the public and the authorities, and Lloyd and Anya have to keep their fakeness from your. The former is made difficult by two things. The Ostanian government's crackdown on espionage and suspicious behavior, and the weird rules from Eden Academy. Yor's brother being a part of the secret police is just its own little thing that we can all collectively ignore because fuck if I'm ever going to give that sister complex motherfucker a passing thought. Yuri Briar can die in a ditch, and I would relish in it. The latter is there for internal tension, which I'll get to later, but to make a long story short, Yor was led to believe that Anya and Lloyd are biological related, and that Lloyd wants Anya to go to Eden at the behest of his late wife. The last external plot is, of course, Anya's contribution to Operation Strix. Arguably, this is a subplot because it's 
still Operation Strix, but since it takes up a majority of screen time and page space and has its own cast of characters apart from the Forgers, we're counting it as its own plot. Anya not only has to maintain contact with Desmond's kid, Damien, but she also has to maintain her grades and conduct. It's very, very difficult to do that when you're two years younger than everyone in your grade, not because you're smart, but because you don't want to be put back into foster care. The telekinesis is just its own obstacle that makes things spicier. Apart from her academics, there's also the fact that Damien is a spoiled little brat who has daddy issues of the abandonment kind. And Damien and Anya naturally hate each other. Well, one more than the other. So getting along with him enough to establish contact with Donovan Desmond is very difficult right now. Now, with the external plots, run our internal ones. These are vastly different, mostly because this is where the slice of life comedy bleeds in. For Twilight, it's finally getting in touch with his roots. He's been running around this espionage business like a headless chicken for years now, and spending time with Anya and the general populace has effectively reminded him of why he set out to do so in the first place. The war took his innocence and his mother, and in exchange for his identity, he took initiative so that no child would ever feel a loss that exponential ever again. For Yor, it's the novel experience of motherhood. There's an irony in making Yor the 80s action hero who doesn't know what to do with this new role that requires a level of vulnerability she's only ever given to her younger brother, to a virtual stranger's child no less. Arguably, she never even got to give Yuri that much too busy working to make sure he never would have to worry about the bills or whatever else. This is also accompanied by her budding feelings for Lloyd Forger, a man who, in her eyes, set aside societal expectations to see her decisions from her perspective, who has been on her side even though the bare minimum he could have done was just gone to this house party as her fake boyfriend. For Anya, it's the novelty of this security she has. She loves that Lloyd indulges her, that Yor protects her, and she absolutely loves that she gets to have this now and that she's out of foster care. This is the first family she's had where she's ever felt that safety, security, and pure happiness, where she wants to give what her new family expects of her, where she doesn't want to run away to be adopted into another family. She wants to stay here for as long as they'll have her. And of course, that brings us to our final internal plot. They explain this to you at the beginning of every episode of the show and every chapter in the manga, but I feel it requires another recap because some points kind of just jumped over people's head. Count with me, alright? <laughs> this is fun because I, I fit as many of these as, as, as much of these as I could, okay. Lloyd Forger is a fake identity for Agent Twilight. He's a fake psychiatrist who has a fake daughter named Anya Forger, who is a four-year-old psychic pretending to be a six-year-old child so she doesn't have to be stuck back into foster care. He met Yor Briar while on a hunt for a fake wife. When asked to be her fake boyfriend for a house party, he announced himself as her husband upon arrival instead. They got engaged that same night after she agreed to be his fake wife so that she could maintain her fake civilian life with its boring day job to continue being an assassin for hire. And now they're a happy fake family together. And that's what you missed. Hungry. Conflict here is that none of these people want a family with each other, but sticking together is mutually beneficial for all parties fake identities. You'll notice there's not really a plot here, and you're right. That's because a plot isn't in the premise, it's when the feelings get involved. Now, I had this whole premise about families of choice and its trope requirements for a reason. Going into my little side project blind, I had no idea what the general fan reception was to Spy Family other than how charmed my friends were with it. And since I hate going into things blind, I had to get some research done and see what the fans actually thought. And, uh... Yeah, not a great idea coming out of a bad fallout with another fandom, I'm not gonna lie, but hey, better safe than sorry, right? A lot of people agree that Spy Family counts as a family of choice. I mean, of course, Yor and Twilight both have experienced loss and want to provide some of the things they never received to Anya. Safety, security, and unconditional love and support. Yor lost her parents, so they weren't there to raise or support her, 
so she won't have to do the difficult thing of risking her life, development, and reputation to keep herself and her brother alive in the midst of a war. Twilight's loss was so impactful that it's still rippling out in his present day life, as he pulls in the extra effort to make sure that war never happens so children, whether Ostanian or Ostalian, never experience something as harrowing as that ever again. These neuroses are key factors in the way Lloyd and Yor raise Anya and behave around each other. Twilight is all always going to be a spy working for peace 24-7, meaning he's always gonna want to patch things up as fast as possible to maintain the status quo. When he snaps at Anya, he always ends up spoiling her afterwards. In turn, when Yor is upset, he tries his best to cheer her up or let her take it easy. He ends up taking every mission Wise throws at him in his resolve to not only be the best agent they have, but to maintain the peace everyone fought for no matter how thankless the damn job is. Yor is always going to try her best to prove herself a capable mother and housemate. She'll clean the house from top to bottom, pick any chore Lloyd can't while he's busy. She'll also try and help Anya with school, teaching her sports and self-defense when she asks for it. When Lloyd needs guidance with parenting, she'll provide it the best she can with the most patient smile on her face. And when her brother comes a-knocking, she deals with the threat he poses to their status quo accordingly. I can see the case made for the Forders to be a found family. But trauma and trauma-shaped behavior does not make a family. Well, a lot of people can argue against that fact, me included, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about the trope. To reiterate, families of choice are a subtrope of true companions, which requires plot to happen before you can say that the choice to become a family isn't just one born out of necessity, but out of love. The Forger family becomes a reality on the third goddamn episode of the show, and it only happens because Twilight is stressing out about how he can't perfectly micromanage his family for an interview because he doesn't trust these two to maintain cover for one minute. What I'm saying is, trauma bonding isn't an optional choice to found family. It's a requirement. And the deal with the Forger family is that none of them are going to tell each other about their individual struggles. Not even Anya, who is so scared of revealing her powers to Lloyd, the man she feels the safest around, that she imagines so many different examples where he figures out what she can do and sends her back to foster care if she even says like one odd thing. Are we all on the same page here? Are we catching what I'm throwing? I'm saying that the, the trope at the heart of this show is not family of choice, it's fake relationship is a trope that is inherently romantic, so I understand the hesitance to tag the story as that. As defined by, well, TV tropes, it's a trope where two characters pretend to be in a relationship but aren't, actually. At times, maybe they can't stand each other or just doing this because it's mutually beneficial or just to help each other out for a myriad of reasons ranging from illegal to personal, but most of the time, the eventuality of this trope is that the fake relationship slowly morphs into a real one, usually without either of them noticing. Babes and besties of the non-existent jury, I do think that everyone needs to understand that Spy Family, a story about an undercover agent starting a family for his own goals, is the epitome of a fake relationship story. Complete with scenes where two out of three people are surprised by the genuineness of their feelings for the third. Parts where they are all really bad at pretending to be in a relationship. Parts where they're all really good at pretending to be in a relationship. To the surprise of other parties. And are flustered by admissions from outsiders about how genuinely wholesome their relationship is. Of course, as I brought up earlier, despite the soundness of my case, Fake relationship is a romantic trope, and though two out of three members of the Forger family are beginning to form romantic feelings for each other, it's not entirely inclusive. But here's my hot take. Ready? They're trying something new. <gasps> Isn't that wild? Who would have thought, huh? I thought nothing was new under the sun anymore. I mean, making fake relationship familial, controversial, iconic behavior, surely never been done before. Jokes aside, <laughs> it really is refreshing to see something like this being done. 
And the thing with fake relationship as a tag is, despite the heartwarming sincerity of the show, it mixes well with the comedy while still upholding the action. Arguably, it does a better job at levying angst than Family of Choice does, but not in the way that people think it's supposed to. Like, I mentioned earlier, The Last of Us is a very good example of a Family of Choice, and um, spoiler alert, the first game doesn't really end with a heartwarming tone. Joel massacres an entire faction of the Fireflies while they were operating on Ellie to finally find a cure to the damn disease that has murdered countless people across this world. There's that saying that a hero will sacrifice one to save the world, but a villain will sacrifice the world to save one. And though the player base did get attached to Ellie, the fact that you slog through hours and hours avoiding and killing plant zombie hordes and witnessed multiple deaths of close friends, virtual strangers, and family members and still justified that Ellie was worth more than those people? Well, it's a story on personal philosophy. <laughs> Let's just say that. And the point there is that the ace part of a family of choice that chooses the lies and betrayal route after establishing the family leans heavily on one side. But consider, in fake relationship trope driven stories, there's always that through line of a doubt and sincerity. Like, wow, Loy sure is really good at selling his lovey dovey shit. Like, whoa, Anya is great at pretending to be their actual child who they actually have parental feelings for. But it's never genuine, it's just acting. They don't actually feel that for you, do they? It's all for the act, an act you establish and consented to for world peace. And then they all start developing true feelings. You find it in the littlest things. Twilight knows all of Anya's favorite things by heart and even starts buying and reading comics of her favorite show and goes through all the efforts to make sure Yor is comfortable and happy to be with them. Anya twists words around to make it seem like she doesn't mind read them and tries to comfort them the best she can when they're unhappy tells Yor that she's strong and can protect Anya, that she wants to go to Eden, and that she's sorry for failing Lloyd. Yor takes Anya's jabs to heart and learns how to cook for them, even going so far as serving Lloyd coffee with milk because she's noticed that he's had more and more stomach aches recently. And before you know it, they're an actual family. One with an indefinite expiration date, but a family nonetheless. And that looming expiration date is what sets up the dread. How much heartbreak will they have to bear now that they have carved out parts of themselves to fit the other two most important people in their life? This is a fucking comedy show! Alright, I do still have some thoughts. Mostly some personal opinions about how fans write these characters. I hate your stupid with a passion. <laughs> as much as I love a himbo, your Briar was not developing like a normal teen should have been, and her husband and child are actively lying to her. So I'm gonna need everyone to please put some respect on her name before Lloyd Forger comes knocking down your door. I also kind of don't like the spy thriller genre sneaking into too much of the fake relationship aspect and fix. Like, there's a lot of stuff out there about how going undercover can fuck with your brain and how spending your time committing to the bit 24-7 can turn you into the act. So I feel like Agent Twilight, who has been doing this for years without even a month-long break between each operation, is kind of just winging it all the time. Like, a lot of his act as Lloyd Forger is just him doing the most. I guess the easiest way of explaining it is that since he's not wearing someone else's face, like that's Agent Twilight's actual real face, it's safe to assume that he's acting mostly genuinely. None of that, oh, they fell in love with the act, not me, BS, you know? You get it. But I think that's mostly it. I'm excited by the fact that of all the Forgers, Yor has the best chance at making contact at the moment. I also want to see whether they'll do a more sci-fi sort of Stranger Things turn when Anya's progenitors come looking for her. <sighs> the possibilities. I don't have the highest hopes, of course. I don't really know how Endo Tatsuya writes his stories, but I hope wherever he's taking us it'll be an amazing thing to witness. As you can tell, going down a rabbit hole of starting a fake has unlocked something in me and now we have this video. I think the lesson here is that when I say I'm about to start writing a fake, everyone has to run to the hills in order to snipe me. It's better for everyone that way. <laughs> Thank you so much for getting to this point. Holy shit. 
like the video, leave a comment, tell me about your theories, and I don't know, link me to your favorite spy family fix so far. I'm intrigued. Thanks once again to my lovely supporters. If you want to support me, you can subscribe or share the video. Other than that, my Kofi is open. I have a Discord server up where I send semi-regular updates, fun links to articles I may have used, some free stuff, bloopers I, if I have any, and more. If that all sounds appealing, consider supporting me. And as always, stay safe. Ingat tayong lahat. Bye!